we got some of you. Um, today we're going to continue with our webinar series at the Institute of the Americas. My name is Jacqueline Sanchez and I am the new Energy Policy Associate at the Institute of the Americas. Um, thank you for being with us today and the agenda for today's webinar uh, regarding Mexico's experience with clean energy will be as following. 10 a.m. we're going to start with this um, introduction of myself and then at 10.05, I'm going to introduce um, Jeremy Martin, Director of Energy Program, who is going to give us a few words and welcome you. After that, we're going to have our main presentation delivered by Francisco Javier Salazar, who is a current uh, Regional Energy Integration Non-Resident Fellow at the Institute of the Americas. At 10.45, we're going to have a Q&A session where you're going to have the time and the opportunity to ask questions to the presenters or to the institute as well. Um, I'm going to he I'm going to type um, in the chat window here, and then this is where you can ask um, questions if you have any questions or comments in the meantime or during the Q and A session. And I hope all of you saw it. It's um, here. I'm typing it again in the uh, left bottom corner. Type in questions. That's where you're going to be able to um, type questions and read the comments of everyone. After that, uh, we're just going to wrap up at um, 11. And that's it. So just wanted to mention about um, our upcoming event, La Jolla Energy Conference. And we look forward to see you there on May. So now let me introduce you to Jeremy Martin, Director of the Energy Program at the Institute of the Americas. Thank you. Thank you, Jacqueline. And, uh, welcome to the Institute and uh, thanks everyone for joining us in our latest iteration of the energy webinar series and sponsored by NERCAP Energy Systems. We uh, greatly uh, appreciate Francisco Javier Salazar's participation this morning. And I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention immediately that uh, we're going to talk about Mexico's clean energy experience today and, and renewables and the energy transition law. But uh, for those of you uh, who, who know Mexico, you know that today is a very important day in the history of Mexico. And in fact, 78 years ago today was uh, when President, then President Lazaro Cardenas expropriated foreign oil assets and which ultimately led to the creation of Pemex. But luckily, we're not going to talk about Pemex and, and, and the oil sector today. We're going to focus on clean energy and, like I said, the energy transition law. Uh, we're quite pleased at the Institute to have Francisco Javier Salazar as our inaugural Regional Energy Integration Fellow. He's a non-resident fellow. He's still living in Mexico, but he's working remotely as our non-resident fellow. Uh, Francisco has uh, just finished a 10-year term at the end of 2015 as the president chairman of Mexico's Regulatory Energy Commission, the CRE, in Mexico. I'm sure many of you know him from his distinguished tenure at Cray in Mexico over the last 10 years. And uh, some of us even go back before then with Francisco when he was chairman of the Lower House Energy Commission at the Camara de Diputados in Mexico. And so he's obviously somebody who's worked, spent his entire career in the energy sector in Mexico, but more importantly, spent his entire career working to advance energy reform and uh, the amazing steps that Mexico has taken forward in the last few years in terms of energy reform. And we're gonna talk spe specifically about one of those areas of energy reform. And like I said, last year at the end of December, Mexico passed an energy transition law. Francisco is gonna walk us through all the ins and outs and where we are today uh, in terms of the, the bid round, the electric sector, and sort of uh, uh, all the bits and pieces, including the renewable energy certificates or the, the, the certificates in Energias Limpias, the, the CELS, and uh, where we are in terms of opportunities. And I think we all uh, are looking forward to hearing his important insights. I don't want to take any more time. Uh, Francisco, I will pass it over to you. And thank you for being a part of the Institute and, and sharing your expertise with us today. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, this is the second winner uh that i've been uh, joining with the institute of the americas right now as a, a fellow as a non-resident fellow of the institute so i'm very happy to be here and uh, to share with you uh, what's been the experience of mexico with uh, clean energy uh, which is uh, something that uh, 
didn't start uh, uh, with the energy reform. It's something that started before uh, that time. Yeah. And as a matter of fact, there's, uh, there's uh, some years of history in terms of uh, the legal framework and the energy policy for clean energies in Mexico. So uh, when did it start? Well, the first, uh, uh, the first law that uh, specifically, specifically talked about renewables was the Ley para el Aprovechamiento de Energías Renovables, which was a part of the package of the previous reform that was uh, discussed in Congo 2008. This was uh, along with the sustainable uh, uh, use of energy law, the two laws that uh, were related to sustainability in the energy sector. This was a law that was basically uh, compiling uh, some of the efforts that the CRE had started before uh, having a legal framework for uh, clean energies. Before 2008, CRE had already published uh, some regulatory instruments, but uh, those regulatory instruments were basically uh, uh, linked to the uh, previous uh, electricity sector uh, legal framework, which was not very specific on this issue. So one of the things that was recognized by Congress in 2008 is that uh, it was necessary to have a very specific legal framework to advance the use of uh, clean energies or renewable energies. So that was the first thing that uh, appeared in the legal framework in Mexico. Then in uh, 2012, after several years of discussion, Congress also passed the, the Climate Change Act, which was uh, a more, uh, it was a very ambitious law. It is uh, a law that describes why it's the uh, kind of uh, programs that Mexico has to have in place in order to really attack the problem of climate change. And uh, it also talked about uh, uh, clean energies, uh, and we will talk about uh, that a little bit later. So that was part of the previous uh, framework before the energy reform. As uh, most of you know, uh, then in 2013, uh, the, the government and uh, the political parties started the discussion of an energy reform. So after months of debate in, in the Congress, in the Senate and the lower house, there was a constitutional reform that was approved in, uh, uh, in 2013, in December of 2013. And uh, as a result of that constitutional reform, there was a whole package of, uh, uh, of primary legislation that was enacted by, by, by the government. And uh, there, were, uh, there was basically one instrument, uh, the Electric Industry Act, that was uh, uh, specifically talking about uh, clean energies. So that, that law was, uh, was published of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of 2014. It's not July, it's uh, August. So there's a minor mistake there. And uh, last year, last year, uh, uh, the Congress passed the, uh, the only missing piece of that comprehensive energy form. It was the Energy Transition Act. During the previous uh, debate, uh, that was uh, one bill that was not discussed, was not debated, because uh, uh, most of the legislators were basically focused on, on the other kind of uh, instruments. Uh, they were uh, devoted to uh, debating uh, the industrial organization in the oil sector, in the electricity sector. And the only thing that they did is just to include some of the goals or some of the uh, uh, some of the goals that were part of the constitutional reform in this uh, electric industry act so this is the kind of legal framework uh, that has been uh, uh, has been uh, published in mexico it's important to say that after the uh, the publishing of the energy transition act uh, which was published on the christmas eve day uh, last year the Renewable Act was, uh, was abrogated. And so uh, th that is a law that uh, is no longer existing. So uh, this is the, the, the current uh, legal framework. Now to move on, I think that it's very important first to recognize that Mexico 
uh, talks about clean energy. It does not only talk about renewables. Renewables was the concept that was enshrined in the first uh, law in the uh, in the Renewables Act, and uh, there was a very specific list of what was considered as renewables under the previous uh, uh, regime. Uh, basically, we had small hydro, and by small hydro, it was understood that it, uh, the capacity of the of the plant should be uh, below 30 megawatts. But uh, uh, after two amendments, uh, there were other exceptions for what was considered as uh, renewable hydro. And basically, it included uh, all the hydro plants that uh, could be built on existing dams or any new or existing project which had more uh, an energy density of uh, more than 10 watts per square meter meters of uh, the reservoir. So that was uh, uh, hydro as renewable. Uh, all wind energy was considered as renewable, solar, uh, you name it, uh, thermal solar or solar PV, and then water, river, tidal and ocean, hydrokinetic energy, geothermal, biofuels. And it's interesting because uh, what the law says that said was that it were uh, that the biofuels that uh, were considered to be renewables were only those biofuels considered by the Biofuels Act. And finally, uh, something that was uh, considered as not exactly of renewable, but that received the same regulatory treatment was efficient cogeneration. So in 2008, uh, the law was a specific renewables. Although it's interesting to mention that the penetration goals of uh, were, uh, was not related or was not uh, uh, in, in terms of renewables, but it was in terms of non fossil fuels. And we will talk about this a little bit later. With the energy reform, uh, first the uh, uh, Electric Industry Act and then the uh, Tran Energy Transition Act uh, were uh, more ambitious in terms of what was considered as clean energy. And basically, uh, in Mexico, uh, clean energy is, is a synonym of non-fossil, uh, non-fossil based uh, energy. So uh, the the list that it's included in the in, in the law is uh, includes obviously the renewables and the efficient cogeneration list that was part of the previous law. Biogas, which interestingly was not specifically considered in the previous regime, although we had some projects that were considered as renewables, but it was not part of the specific list. Hydrogen is uh, considered as a clean energy, but it's subject to efficiency criteria. Criteria. All hydro right now is considered as, uh, as a clean energy. All nuclear is, uh, I mean, nuclear energy is considered as uh, clean energy. Biomass and uh, all kinds of biomass, uh, including, uh, for instance, uh, the sugar mills, uh, uh, the sugar cane that is uh, used in the in the sugar mills. Municipal waste. This is something that was uh, excluded in previous uh, legal framework, uh, unless it uh, was uh, uh, subject to environmental uh, criteria. Right now, it's specifically in, in, uh, detailed as such. Carbon capture and storage is considered and as, as clean energy and finally any other technologies uh, that uh, would have low emissions and by low emissions uh, the trans energy transition uh, uh, act uh, uh, considers that uh, it should have less than 100 kilograms per megawatt hour of uh, energy generated. so this is what it's considered as clean energies in mexico i think this is important because uh, it allows for a more efficient uh, 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 matrix of generation. Uh, it also reduces the cost of uh, meeting the goal of, uh, of uh, reducing uh, greenhouse emissions in, uh, in the energy sector. So what were the goals that were part of the legal framework? So let's go back to the first uh, law, the uh, renewables law. Basically, there was a transitional article where those goals were written, and uh, the, the goals were uh, for uh, several years. For 2024, the goal was to have a maximum of 65% of uh, fossil fuels-based generation. 
as I mentioned before, uh, although the law was uh, uh, the renewables law, the goal was not written in terms of renewables. It was written in terms of non-fossil fuels generation. So that was the goal for tw uh, 2024. Now, for 2035, that uh, uh, generation should be reduced, the fossil fuels-based generation should be reduced to 60%. And by 2050, the goal was to have 50% as a maximum of fossil fuel-based generation. So those were the first uh, goals included in the 2008 uh, legal framework. In 2009, with the climate change law, uh, the goal, the, the, the only goal that was uh, uh, considered was uh, to have by 2024 the same, uh, the same goal that uh, was included in the renewables uh, law, with the difference that here uh, the, the, uh, the, the term that was used was non-fossil fuel but clean energies. But uh, again, clean energies here was a synonym of uh, non-fossil fuels uh, used uh, in generation. So that was for climate change. What is right now the status with the transition, energy transition law? Well, the energy transition law has uh, three specific goals. And those specific goals are for year 2018, which uh, is basically to have, we should have at least 25% of uh, generation based on clean energies by 2018. Then by 2021, uh, we should have 30% of uh, minimum uh, of generation with uh, clean energies. And uh, by 2024, we should meet the same goal that it's included in the climate change law and that was part of the uh, renewables law. Uh, you have to, uh, to notice something that it's very interesting. The energy transition law does not include goals beyond 2024. This is something that is different from the uh, Renewables Act. And uh, that means that the goals could be more ambitious uh, than the previous goals. And basically because the energy transition law mentions that the uh, percentage of uh, clean energy should be increasing in time, considering, of course, uh, economic efficiency. But uh, it's interesting that we don't have right now specific goals beyond 2024. So that opens the door for the, a debate on what should be the goals beyond 2024. So, but that's what we have right now in the legal framework. Now let's talk a little bit about the uh, regulation that existed uh, before the energy reform, because this is a regulation it is a regulation that it's still valid for all the projects that were uh, started uh, before 2014, before the 11th of August of 2014, or for projects that were that had already filled a permit request by that date. So all the projects that uh, started before that date. Uh, uh, are subject, if they want to, to the previous regulation. So what were the most important uh, elements of the previous regulation for renewables or clean energy? Well, first of all, uh, we had what we call the energy bank. This energy bank was something like a massive uh, uh, net metering where uh, uh, the, the, the mechanism worked as this. Uh, uh, the, uh, the electricity that was generated was injected into the grid and it was valued at the price of uh, electricity in the point of injection. Uh, so if you had uh, an excess uh, of generation compared to your demand profile, that energy had an economic value. Uh, you had an energy surplus that could be used in the future uh, to compensate uh, uh, an energy deficit if your generation source was generating below what was your demand profile. But uh, here the important thing to, to have in mind is that uh, the kilowatt hour or the megawatt hour that was uh, generated uh, varied a long time and varied also according the generation injection point and the consumption point.
point. So uh, if, if we had uh, energy that was uh, generating during the base point, it had a lower uh, lower value because the rate uh, during the base period was lower. If you have excess energy, for instance, during the peak, that energy should cost more. But if, uh, if uh, on the contrary, as in this example, uh, you had less generation during the peak time, the problem for you was that uh, the energy that you have as, an, uh, as a surplus during the base period was going to value less. And uh, the, uh, the compensation was calculated uh, using also what was the value of energy in the consumption point. So that was one, uh, that was the first uh, regulatory instrument that was used to promote or to uh, incentivize uh, a renewable supply. Uh, the other uh, incentive was the uh, a special wheeling rate that was uh, 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 designed for uh, renewable projects. And uh, here, the logic of this wheeling rate was uh, that uh, you couldn't uh, locate uh, renewable projects uh, where uh, demand needed them. You, the only place you could locate uh, a renewable project was uh, where the uh, renewable source of energy was available. So that was in conflict with the previous uh, conventional trans, uh, transmission uh, or, or to the previous mechanism to calculate the transmission rates, which was very interesting. It was, uh, it was a, trans, uh, a methodology that uh, tried to incentivize uh, generation projects where generation was needed because uh, if that was the case, the wheeling rate was uh, lower, but if your generation project was located in an area where the, the transmission was going to go with the flow, and it was going to saturate the transmission lines, the wooling rate was going to be higher. So it was a, uh, it was a very well-designed uh, mechanism to calculate the rates and to send signals to the market to locate a new generation plant, but it was not uh, useful for, uh, for clean energy projects because uh, most of the times, uh, generation for uh, this kind of project was uh, located in places like Oaxaca, where uh, the generation was, uh, uh, where the demand was not very high, or were located in Chiapas, where, of course, was the same case. And uh, you didn't have projects in areas like in Mexico City or in Monterey, where the demand is very high. So, uh, and, and that was because of the nature of clean energies, because of the nature of uh, renewable sources. And uh, so basically here, what CRE decided was to have a different mechanism to calculate rates. Uh, so CRE opted for uh, a very uh, transparent, very easy uh, way to understand uh, the willing rate. It was a postage stamp uh, kind of rate. And it was calculated based on uh, long run marginal cost and uh, considering the benefits of substituting uh, uh, fossil fuel that was used in uh, in marginal plants uh, uh, with CFE and that uh, was going to be substituted with generation of uh, clean energy projects. So here you have what are the uh, current values of those uh, willing rates. CRE updates those rates every month. Every every month uh, those rates are uh, adjusted based on inflation. So here uh, you have the uh, the values for March. It's not February. Excuse me. It's March. Those are the values for March. And uh, basically, what you do is uh, you pay for the uh, you're using. If you're uh, connected, if your project is connected in high tension and your consumption is at high tension, you will only pay the high tension rate. But if you're connected in high tension and you're consuming in medium tension, basically what you will have to do is to add both rates and multiply the kind uh, by the, excuse me, by the volume of energy that is transmitted. And the same happens if you're consuming in low tension. If you're consuming in low tension and you're generating in high tension, you will have to add up the three rates if you're uh, generating in medium tension and uh, consuming in low tension, what you will do is just add up the two uh, last values. So it's a very easy to understand mechanism. It's a, again, it's a postage stamp uh, 
uh, uh, type of rate and uh, you just multiply uh, those rates by the volume of energy that it's transmitting. And the other uh, instrument that was very interesting was the net metering scheme for uh, for small and medium scale projects. Uh, this is uh, a mechanism that was designed for small users that wanted to put some uh, solar PVs on their rooftops and also for commercial users. And uh, basically there are two kinds of uh, uh, contracts. One for small scale projects where, uh, where uh, the interconnection was at low tension, below one kilovolts. And for medium scale projects where uh, uh, the medium tension was used and uh, basically uh, included projects uh, that were connected below 69 kilovolts of tension. And here in this uh, case, uh, it was for all users. You could uh, install up to 500 kilowatts of capacity. In the case of small scale, the, the maximum capacity was uh, 30 kilowatts for com commercial users and 10 kilowatts for residential users. And finally, uh, uh, as I mentioned before, efficient cogeneration received the same uh, kind of benefits. What they did was to uh, issue what was the criteria to, co to consider a cogeneration as efficient. And basically, uh, it uh, Cray developed a, a methodology to calculate uh, the efficiency of, of, of a plant, and uh, it compared that efficiency with a minimum standard that was uh, related to the capacity of the plant. So if you if your plant was a small plant uh, below uh, 500 kilowatts of capacity, the uh, minimum efficiency uh, that you had to have above that uh, the standard efficiency was 5%. If it was uh, below 30 megawatts of uh, capacity, it had to be 10% of uh, increase in efficiency. If it was uh, uh, as high as uh, 100 megawatts, had to increase 15%. And uh, if uh, you had a very large cogen plant, uh, it had to be above 20% uh, of efficiency gain. So those were the basic instruments that uh, were used to promote uh, renewables and the clean energies in the past. And again, as I mentioned before, these regulatory instruments continue to be valid to all those projects that were developed uh, uh, previous to the energy reform or that had already submitted a request to obtain a permit before the 11th of August of 2014. So what were the results of those uh, efforts in the past? Well, let me start with uh, net metering for small users. Uh, as you can see here in this slide, uh, there's been a, a tremendous growth of installed capacity on rooftops. Right now, we have more than 100 megawatts of uh, 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 100 megawatts of capacity that is installed in rooftops, and uh, also some uh, uh, projects related to uh, the use of biogas or to small wind generators in houses. So. Here we have a, a, a capacity that it's almost in doubling every year, and uh, it can continue to grow as long as the uh, uh, CFE rates for uh, for small users uh, uh, for the uh, highest uh, uh, higher uh, kind of users continue to pay a high rate. Uh, I think this uh, uh, these projects will continue to to grow, and we could. Are, uh, the numbers uh, that uh, have been uh, estimated by CRE uh, talk about probably having at least uh, 500 megawatts of, uh, of capacity for rooftops in the in the coming years. Now, in terms of uh, what, uh, of, uh, of the clean energy matrix uh, that was developed up to last year and which was related uh, to the previous schemes, the previous uh, legal framework. What you can see is that we, we have uh, something like uh, almost 18 uh, uh, gigawatts of uh, operating capacity as part of the clean energy matrix. Most of it was related to large hydro that was developed by CFE in the past and also during uh, uh, a couple of uh, big dams that were 
uh, constructed uh, during the last uh, 10 years. Uh, it was the, 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 the largest uh, percentage of, uh, of clean energy uh, uh, as part of the matrix. And, uh, but uh, you have to uh, know that in Mexico, uh, the large scale uh, hydro plants are not always operated. They are subject to other criteria like uh, floodings and uh, the, the level of water in the dams. So uh, that's why, even though sometimes uh, it can appear that it's a large capacity, the plant uh, factor, the, uh, uh, the plant, uh, the, uh, plant uh, is not used all the time. Now, in terms of uh, private projects that were developed as part of the uh, previous uh, regulatory instruments, basically we have almost uh, three uh, gigawatts of uh, projects that were developed under this scheme. Uh, basically, what you can see here is that we are excluding all the CFE large hydro plants were not uh, developed as a, as a result of the previous regulatory instruments. Uh, we are, of course, excluding new uh, There was this uh, uh, regulatory framework uh, used to promote uh, renewables, but more because uh, uh, they considered that it was important for them to develop this kind of project. So but the rest of the projects, these three gigawatts of operating uh, uh, projects were the result of the previous regulatory scheme. So just to finish up this part, let me just uh, describe what was uh, 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 the logic behind policy to, to obtain the goals. Uh, I mean, how was policy supposed to work? So uh, in the previous scheme, basically you had a goal, a visible goal yeah, that was by 24, we should have 35% of, uh, uh, of clean energies uh, as part of the uh, generation matrix. Uh, but the, uh, it, if, if you had a gap, if, uh, if, if your uh, projections were that, uh, you were only going to have a 25% of non-fossil fuel projects. What uh, you were supposed to do is to uh, force CFE to uh, mandate CFE to construct the uh, gap to meet that goal. So th that was uh, a policy, th that was how policy was supposed to work in the past. So now let's talk about new regulation. What has changed with the energy reform? And let me just start by describing generally what is the new market structure. Under the new market structure, there's a lot of flexibility in the system. Uh, before the reform, uh, private generation was allowed under two basic schemes. You were either allowed to sell electricity to CFE as an IPP or as a small producer, which was uh, uh, basically a uh, a project uh, below 30 megawatts. And uh, you were also allowed to generate electricity for your own consumption under the self-supply scheme. And under that case, you, you could use the grid, you paid a, a rate, the winning rate that we were talking before, but uh, it was a very rigid scheme in the sense that every time you wanted to include a new member of the self-scheme project, you have to change your permit, you have to modify it, you have to pay for that, and uh, it was, uh, uh, the, the tr tr transaction costs were very high because uh, it took some time to do that, it was not immediate, you had to ask CFE what was going to be the result of that, you had to recalculate uh, sometimes the wooden rate, and uh, it took, uh, it took uh, a lot of time, so it was not very flexible. On the, the new market structure, there's a lot of flexibility. You don't need to ask for permission to include or uh, to uh, sell electricity to new customers. Uh, what you need to do is, if you're a generator, you need to uh, sign a contract with NAS, the system, the insurance system operator, and that's it. Uh, and uh, if you want to buy electricity directly in the market, you have to be a qualified user. Uh, to become a qualified user, uh, there's a threshold that it's uh, going to be reduced. As a matter of fact, for instance, after the 11th of August of this year, that threshold is going to be one uh, 
uh, megawatt of capacity, but uh, the law says that that threshold should continue to reduce as time passes by. So you you can sign uh, bilateral contracts, uh, these kind of uh, bilateral arrangements where it's a, it's an arrangement between two parties. They are, they are going to be allowed. Uh, you also have the spot market where you can sell your electricity. And very importantly, for uh, clean energies, you have auctions, long-term auctions to buy clean energy certificates, long-term auctions to buy uh, energy, uh, electricity, and long-term auctions to buy also capacity. And you also have some medium-term auctions, uh, but the most important ones are the longer because the, the, those kind of auctions are bankable projects. And then you have three kind of uh, load-serving entities. You have uh, the uh, uh, qualified users load-serving entities uh, for eligible use. You have uh, the basic service uh, load-serving entities for small users. And you also have what it's called the last resource load-serving uh, entities, which are uh, load-serving entities that uh, serve uh, customers that uh, uh, for some reason are not receiving energy from the uh, uh, the qualified service load serving entities. And you also have the non-supplier marketeers that uh, cannot sell electricity directly to the customers, but they can sell to the suppliers and can buy electricity from, from the generators. So that's the basic uh, scheme. And this new, this new market structure has been implemented uh, through different uh, regulatory uh, instruments. Uh, first, uh, we have the constitutional amendment. Uh, then we had this uh, primary legislation uh, that was passed in August. Then we had the bylaws in October. And uh, in October also of 2014, uh, Senator published the guidelines and criteria for the issuance of clean energy certificates. After that, in, uh, in the, uh, in, in, before the first, uh, the first quarter of last year, uh, Senator also published the Clean Energy Certificates requirements for 2018, which were 5%. And as a matter of fact, right now, uh, there's a public consultation for the requirements for 2019. The uh, proposal by Senator is 6.9 for 2019. That is uh, still under public consultation. Then on September uh, of uh, last year, uh, Senator also published the market rules uh, and the long-term auction rules were also published in November. And uh, during this month, CRE will have to publish uh, two instruments, the uh, system operation of the system management for energy certificates and the compliance procedures uh, regulations. And also the uh, regulatory criteria to establish the sanctions for non-compliance with clean energy certificates. So this is the new legal framework. So how is policy now supposed to work? It's a little bit different from the past. So uh, what it's, uh, again, the same case is that you have certain goals to, to meet. So for instance, uh, uh, this year or last year, uh, excuse me, last year, you knew that by 2021, you wanted to meet a goal of 25% of clean energy. So you knew that you have already 18% of generation matrix as an existing clean plant. You also knew that you had some projects in the pipeline that uh, uh, were already under construction or that had PPAs that made them bankable and that were going to be ready by 2021. So there's a, there's a gap. So, so that gap is going to be filled with, uh, with uh, new projects that need to be finance with, uh, uh, with clean energy certificates. As uh, most of you know, the clean energy certificate is a mechanism to meet two things, to uh, solve the missing money uh, problem that you have with, uh, with a marginal uh, price in the market that it's sometimes not enough to pay the fixed cost of the investment, but also it's a mechanism that allows you to meet the goal. It's, it's uh, the missing gap uh, um, uh, a mechanism to meet the missing gap for goals of clean energy. So that's the way it is supposed to work. So now let's talk about how the spot market will work with clean energy certificates. So uh, this, is, this slide shows uh, how is the, the mechanism going to work. 
So first, uh, you have the clean energy plan that generates electricity. In the, uh, in the, in the coming 10 working days, uh, Senase will report to CRE the amount of clean energy that it's generated by the plant. The generator can also do that in the system. So that information will uh, go to CRE. In 10 working days after that information is uh, uh, received by CRE, CRE will issue the uh, clean energy certificate. Uh, of course, uh, uh, during this process, uh, CRE will cross-check information between different sources. Uh, of course, the information that comes from Senase, the information that comes from the generator, the information that comes from the uh, grid uh, uh, owners. Uh, so after the clean energy certificate is issued, uh, those clean energy certificates will be uh, allowed to be offered in the market for bilateral arrangements, or uh, they will have to be delivered under the contracts that are uh, the result of the auctions. And each month, uh, uh, an agent that has obligations to meet uh, clean energies, uh, clean energy requirements, can advance uh, their obligations. They can use those clean energies to reduce their obligations, so they can make partial settlements. But in the end of the year, which is the uh, the, the period in formal terms, is one year. So uh, even uh, if you're uh, if if you make some partial settlements by the end of the year you're supposed to meet your clean uh, energies obligations. So whatever you need to do in terms of uh, 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 buying clean energy certificate, you will have to do it. If you have uh, already paid some partial, if you have uh, made some partial settlements, you will reduce that. And um, what will happen is that uh, once you do that, uh, the clean energy certificates are canceled. Well, as a matter of fact, those clean energy certificates are canceled every time they are used. So, uh, but uh, the other thing that it's important is that uh, you can uh, uh, you can use a carryover mechanism. You can postpone part of your obligations for the futures, and we will talk about that in, in the meanwhile. So, how does this operate also in terms of uh, the agents that have the clean energy certificates uh, obligations and let me just start by saying, who are those agents? Uh, different to what happens in some other countries, here the obligations uh, rely on the demand side of the market, not on the supply side of the market. So, uh, who are those agents that have these kind of obligations? Well, first of all, the qualified users uh, uh, that go directly to the market. The final users that are also are uh, being served under isolated supply. The load-serving entities, or the, 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 the ones that uh, serve uh, the, uh, the, the final users, and, uh, of course, the uh, loads that are linked to legacy, legacy interconnection contracts. So all the demand side is supposed to meet those requirements. So how does the system work on the demand side? If you're an agent, what you will do is you will have to report your consumption of electricity during the month. In 10 working days, uh, you will have to do that. Uh, uh, you will have to calculate what are your obligations in terms of the requirements that were published by, by Senair. You report that uh, to CRE. Senase also reports the information on the consumption. So again, CRE, uh, CRE will check that information. Uh, we'll do some cross-checking. And uh, if there's a need, uh, the agents may uh, re request for clarification. So based on that, you, you can make uh, those partial settlements that I was mentioning before, or uh, you can accumulate your obligations for the end of the year. And then you have uh, this uh, carryover and accumulation of cleanery certificates uh, uh, characteristic of this market. This is something that was introduced in order to avoid uh, the uh, problem that you have in this kind of markets if you don't have flexibility. You can have a market that doesn't clear, that does not clear because uh, demand does not meet uh, supply. And that is sometimes the case when uh, you don't have flexibility, where you do not allow for carryovers on the demand side and where you do not allow for uh, accumulation on the supply side. But if you allow for accumulation of energy certificates and you allow for some carryovers, then uh, uh, it's more feasible that this market will work properly. 
So what are the characteristics of this carryover mechanism? Well, uh, the, the guidelines and criteria for the issuance of clean energy certificates that were, uh, were published in the 31st of October of 2014 establish a maximum of 25% of the obligations per period. And you can do it up for uh, up to two years at a 5% rate. And so that will cost you 5%. Uh, that was the uh, carryover mechanism before the energy, energy transition law. In the energy transition law, one of the transitional articles says that uh, from 2018 to the end of uh, 2021, the 31st of December of that year, it's a four-year period, uh, that uh, maximum can go up to 50% instead of the 25% if, two, uh, if uh, one of the conditions or two conditions uh, apply. If the number of clean energy certificate is less than 70% of the total requirement for each of the uh, first two years, or if the clean energy uh, certificate price in the first uh, four auctions, I mean the auctions for 2018, 19, 20, and 21, is, up, is above 60 UDIs. UDIs uh, the acronym for the United Inversion. One of these is uh, the equivalent right now to 5.44 Mexican pesos. So uh, if, those uh, if one of those conditions uh, are, are met, then you can uh, increase uh, the maximum to from 25% to 50%. And that was a result of the uh, loving of the industry that was interested in introducing more flexibility because they were afraid that uh, uh, not enough uh, clean energy certificates were going to be in the market. Now, something that it's very important and that I consider a crucial issue to have a mechanism that will work is a clearinghouse. And this is something that was included as part of this transitional article. It says that Sener must set up a clearinghouse uh, for this kind of, uh, uh, of uh, projects and uh, it establishes uh, the same period uh, I would like that uh, clearinghouse to be uh, ready before that, but the maximum that Sener will have is this four-year period. And now let's talk a little bit about the non-compliance penalties. Here you have them. Uh, basically, uh, Cray decided not to use the maximum penalty, which was, uh, which was 60 times the minimum wage. Uh, here you have the cost of a minimum wage. And um, uh, basically, because it was going to cost a lot, but uh, one thing that it's very important is that payment of the penalty does not, use, does not release you from the obligation of acquiring the clean energy certificate. And the other instrument, I will finish with this, that it's very important are the long-term auctions. And uh, uh, the objectives of those auctions is to have a competition between different technologies. Uh, you want to pay according to the value of a power plant. It's uh, different in uh, every case. But you want to allow projects to be bankable. If you don't have a long-term contract, it's very difficult to finance a project. So these auctions will, uh, uh, will deliver those long-term contracts, 20-year contracts for uh, uh, clean energy certificates, 50 years for energy and capacity. And uh, as I mentioned before, you will buy clean energy certificates, associated energy and capacity. Here you have the calendar. I won't uh, go into the details of this calendar, just to mention that, that by the end of this month, we'll have the first uh, results of these first auctions. We'll have decision and the assignments of contracts. And it's interesting because the preliminary uh, results, so what we have seen is that uh, uh, this auction seems to be attractive because uh, the volume solicited by CFE were 6.3 million of uh, certificates, 6.3 million of megawatts hours of energy, and 500 megawatts of capacity. And what has been offered, uh, what has been submitted as offers, of course, not all of these, uh, not all these uh, projects will meet the pre-qualification. We will see. But uh, at least what was offered, we had a number of uh, 103 bidders, 46, uh, 8 uh, offers 109 million certificates of clean energy, 102 million megawatt hours of energy that were offered, 830 megawatts of capacity. And we have a lot of technologies, a lot of variety, solar PV, wind, hydro, geothermal, and efficient cogeneration. And for capacity, we have natural gas combined cycles.
So that's it. Those are the uh, uh, the results of this uh, auction up to today. We will see what happens on the 31st of March. And with this, I end up uh, my uh, my presentation. And I'm ready for any kind of uh, questions that you might have. Fantastic. And what a wonderful, positive, optimistic uh, slide to end with in those uh, what I guess could be called as a, an auction that's been oversubscribed. I mean, obviously, we'll see what happens with but still amazing the uh, the levels of of uh, bids that have been received uh, that will be decided in the next couple of weeks. Thank you so much, Francisco, for your extremely comprehensive and detailed uh, analysis. Wow, we went through, I think, about eight years uh, or more of legislation and, and activities in, in about 40 minutes. So thank you so much. But there are there are several questions, and let me start with uh, let me start with one that actually Jason was with us last week in Argentina, and and we talked a little bit about some of these things. So I'm gonna jump right to his first question: Is the concept of the energy bank expected to be continued into the new regime? We'll start there, and then I'll look at these other questions, and give you a chance to answer that one first. Okay. Yes, the energy bank will continue in existing projects that were related to previous regulation. If you're a project, again, that was uh, uh, operating before the 11th of August of 2014, or if you own a project that uh, had requested a permit, even if you hadn't uh, obtained it yet, but uh, you had a, a formal request to obtain a permit before that same date, you're, you're entitled to apply for the energy ban. Now, for the new regime, this is something that is in theory possible. I mean, uh, Article uh, 20 uh, that talks about uh, the 20 or 22, I don't remember exactly right now, but that talks about the powers of, uh, of, of CRAN uh, says that um, if it is necessary, CRAN could, uh, could go ahead with uh, other kind of regulatory instruments. And uh, of course, one of the uh, regulatory instruments could be the energy bank. So far, so far, uh, uh, the, the what what Cray has decided, along with Fener, is that they are going to to trust in uh, or to rely on the clean energy certificates if they work well. In the, if there is not a need to have another regulatory instrument, they will they will continue using the clean energy certificates. If not. Craig could consider to use other regulatory instruments. Excuse me, it, it is Article 12, but it's uh, Article 12. The uh, it is uh, it is uh, fraction. Let me see, it's fraction uh, 20, if I am not mistaken. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, 20. Yes, uh, it is uh, Section 20 that says that Craig could use other regulatory instruments if clean energy certificates are not enough to meet the goals. I would assume like you talked about, you know, filling the gap. I think that was the, the terminology you used. I imagine that to, to make sure you hit the goal by the, the timeline, uh, you know, all, all tools at, the, at, at the, the government and, and disposal should be used. Um, let, let's jump, to, we'll come back to the, the clean energy certificates, but first the question more about the um, the, the new market and the question is what are the expectations regarding how much of the market will be bilateral agreements versus auctions? Uh, I think most of it and by nature and by the uh, uh, the conditions of the uh, of the, um, of the market of the, uh, right now most of the uh, of the clean energy certificates uh, available in the market will be the results of, uh, of the auctions and that's just because uh, uh, between 70 and 80 percent of the demand will be supplied by the basic service uh, load serving entity CFP. So uh, and CFP is uh, uh, as a uh, as a basic service uh, supplier uh, and any other private entity that would like to become also a basic service supplier is forced or is obligated to buy uh, clean energy certificates through auctions. So. Uh, that means that the largest share of the of a market will uh, be related to auctions, uh, and uh, also the law allows for uh, uh, to include, excuse me, to include uh, uh, the uh, re requirements of other private entities. Although 
for this to work, uh, you need a clearing house. That's why I mentioned that it was very important to have a clearing house. If, if you have a clearing house, it is going to be easier to include in those auctions the needs of private players, of uh, qualified uh, service uh, uh, load service entities, for instance. So uh, I believe that in the future auctions, uh, and as, as, as soon as we have that uh, clearing auction, uh, that clearing house uh, is installed in market, uh, most of the certificates will be bought as a result of these auctions. But of course, you will have a secondary market, you will have a, a spot market where you, you will be able to sell uh, uh, your excess, uh, the excess of uh, clean energy certificates that you have or where you will be able to buy any certificates that you need to meet your requirements. Perfect, perfect. Let's. Uh, we're running out of time, but the folks can stick with us. We'll go for a couple more minutes. There's a few more questions that have come in. Uh, let me let me go to this one about the uh, clean energy certificate marketplace. And the question is whether they can be bought or sold in the U.S. as well. And if so, what is the trans border or the cross border wheeling cost? Well, the the the, the no, there's not a the wheeling cost for energy that it's uh, uh, sent to the US, it's going to be the willing cost uh, that it's paid by any, uh, any project. Uh, that's not going to be different. Now, uh, right now there is a debate and there is a lot of talkings between uh, the regulators in, uh, in the US and the CRE and Tener because uh, what you need to have uh, in order to uh, have a market that it's uh, transboundary is you have to have a, a, an, uh, some kind of a harmonized criteria for, for certificates. So there is an ongoing discussion between regulators, and this is something that at least in theory is possible, but you need to, you need to make some fine tune to, to allow to, uh, for these kind of uh, transactions. So that'll be uh, that'll be your second research project uh, here as the the fellow at the institute. And just go on top of all the other things I've already asked you. To. <laughs> How can we make a North American clean uh, certificate market? Uh, a little bit more serious or more uh, germane to this conversation right now. Question about the uh, distributed generation. What is your view on clean renewable distributed generation in this new context? Uh, secondary question, how should the regulatory framework on this topic evolve? It's a very interesting question. So, so, sorry, Jeremy, uh, uh, some kind of noise was there. Uh, oh, uh, sure. And I couldn't, uh, the question is your views on clean, renewable, distributed generation in the new framework, in the new context of the regulatory environment, and how should that regulatory framework evolve on this, on this topic? Uh, well, that's a very interesting question indeed, because yeah. uh, uh, the other element that was brought by the energy transition law was clean uh, energy uh, distributed uh, generation, distributed generation with clean energy. And uh, one of the things that it's mentioned in the energy transition law is that uh, the Treasury Department, uh, Hacienda, uh, along with uh, CRE and CENER, should uh, uh, make some evaluations to uh, change the nature of uh, existing subsidies and uh, instead of uh, giving subsidies uh, to, to, to users, uh, giving those subsidies for, the, uh, for them to invest in, uh, for instance, in solar PV panels mm -hmm. uh, so they can reduce their consumption. And uh, so Hacienda is supposed to make this analysis in terms of cost or benefit. And uh, based on that, uh, there could be some kind of, of incentives to, to, uh, to have more uh, distributed generation with uh, clean energy. And uh, also something that it's worth mentioning is that uh, in the last two to three years, uh, CRE has been uh, putting more uh, attention to this issue. And as a matter of fact, before the reform, there was a uh, a regulatory roadmap for smart grids and uh, distributed generation that was uh, put on hold a little bit because of the, all the regulatory instruments that had to be uh, published uh, as a result of the reform. But this is something that CRE is taking up again, and uh, so I see a, a future for these kind of uh, things. 
No, I mean, absolutely. This is, uh, and I think we, depending on who you talk to, you hear things, the, the three Ds, the, 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 the three Ds of the energy transition, digitalization, decarbonization, distributed generation. So let's, we'll certainly keep talking about this. Uh, let's wrap up with a couple uh, pretty specific questions. Let me start with one that's more of, uh, I guess, uh, soliciting your opinion, Francisco, vis-a-vis -vis CFE's new entities. Uh, or the the new uh, organization of of the uh, Empresa Productiva del Estado, uh, and the question is uh, the uh, the bankability of these entities and as off takers and auctions and market participants. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, well, basically, I think uh, it's not going to be a problem because uh, uh, the basic service supplier is going to be. Uh, uh, very well taken care of by, by, by the state because uh, of its importance. And uh, CFE, even though it, it has uh, some financial problem, it has the backup of, uh, of the government. So I, I don't see any problem with that. And on the other side, here you don't have a problem. Basically, the basic service uh, supplier will get, I mean, the risk would come basically from the market not paying for that, but the market is going to pay for that because it's going to be included as part of the of the rate. So they, they are going to pay for that. I don't see a, a, any, any kind of risk uh, for that. Uh, the, the, the risk that CFE will face will be not uh, there, will be probably with their generation uh, subsidiaries because they can lose some market. But uh, basic generation mm. service uh, entity, I don't see and having a problem in, in, in the near future. Okay, no, perfect. So uh, here's a question that uh, will wrap up on a very, very specific question, uh, similar to, to, to what was just mentioned in terms of bankability. But it, I'll read this just so it's very clear. CRE released a regulation requiring qualified suppliers to forward contract for clean energy certificates, power and energy for 18 years, according to the percentage of estimated customer load. If a new qualified supplier typically only signs a contract with qualified users for one to three years, how can they be required to forward contract for 18 years when the load may depart for a competitor supplier when short-term contracts end? So we'll end on a very simple one there for you, Francisco. Yeah, well, no, basically what you need to do is, uh, uh, what, what you will do is, uh, this is something that hasn't been probably very clear, and it's the kind of, uh, of, uh, of uh, requirement. But basically, if you have a short-term contract for three years, what you will include in your schedule, uh, in the schedule that you will have to submit to CRE, is that you will need to have a, a clean energy certificates only for those three years. You can fill up the rest of the spaces with zeros. You can say, uh, well, for the fourth year, I will have a zero. For the fifth year, I will have zero. So, I mean, it. it it is the way you you fill up the form, but basically you can say, well, I have a, I have a contract for the, the uh, clean energy certificates that I need for the first year, for the second year, for the th third year, and the fourth year, since I don't have a contract to deliver energy, my requirements will be zero. You just need to put up a zero there, something like that. Okay, no, I think that's. I think that clarifies, like you said. It, it's, it's there's so much. It seems there's so many pieces, and there's so many things that are are, are being overhauled. I, I think you know, it it, it the, sometimes the the devil can be in the details, but there's also a, a need to continue to clarify, and and that's exactly what you've done today, uh, on such a wonderful level. So I want to thank you again for sharing your insights and, and expertise on this topic, and we're going to keep talking about this. And, and in fact, you see on the screen the La Jolla Energy Conference. We're celebrating our 25th anniversary this year of the La Jolla Conference on May 25th and 26th. These topics of energy transition and clean energy in Mexico, but but in in the hemisphere more largely. Uh, We'll certainly figure prominently at that. And I want to just uh, also say thank you and congratulations. Uh, your first webinar, Jacqueline Sanchez, who started here at the Institute just a few days ago. And so glad to have her aboard. And we look forward to seeing everyone here in La Jolla or online. Stay tuned. We'll be uh, lo lining up some uh, additional webinars in the not too distant future. But please be sure to join us here in La Jolla in May. Francisco will be here. All of us will be here. And we look forward to seeing you. Thanks, everyone. Have a wonderful weekend. Thank, thank you, you very Jeremy. Much. Bye -bye. Thank you, Jeremy, and thank you, Francisco. Um, thank you very much as well for attending to everyone and look forward to speaking to you soon.
Thanks.